Romans chapter number 8. And we got down to around verse 23 last week. And we'll pick up reading there in verse number 23. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. It's good to see everybody. The Lord's blessed us with a beautiful day today. Glad to be in His house. So Romans 8, 23, the Bible says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our bodies, our body. Now we know here last week we talked about how that a whole of earth, that all of creation is in travail because it's under the curse. So it's waiting to be redeemed from that. And we know that we look around in this life, you know, once you get saved, God doesn't just eradicate all the troubles and the sorrows and the pain that you got. You know, there are people who teach that when God saves a person, that their life is prosperous from then on. And that's not a biblical doctrine. You know, you look to look take a survey in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and all of the men of God and the people of God who served him, a lot of times it didn't end well for them in this life and in the way that man looks at things. They didn't have big mansions. They weren't driving a Mercedes. I mean, there are Christians who can drive Mercedes. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is that's what they promise you. God promises that there's going to be troubles and trials. Job 14.1 says, Man that is born of a woman is but a few days and full of trouble. I've known troubles since I've been a Christian. And I'm sure everybody in here, if we went around and asked you, has it been a bed of roses for you since you got saved? No, it ain't. Because when you get saved, a battle begins. And like we, we covered in Romans chapter 7, you've got the flesh and the old Adamic nature under Adam that is cursed, lusting and warring against the Spirit, the new creature that's been created in you in Christ Jesus. But even now, we're trying to live this Christian life, and we're doing it through the power of the Holy Ghost, but there's still troubles, there's still trials, and some things that we cannot understand. Can't understand it. And we're not meant to understand it. You know, it's not for us to know all the things that God knows, because then we'd be God. But it's for us to trust Him, to put our trust in Him, and to know that He is able to do everything He said He can do. If you go back and also do a survey in the Bible of all the promises God's made, they were fulfilled down to the letter. Every time. There are stuff that's yet to be fulfilled, but all the things that were fulfilled, look at just the prophecies concerning His birth. In Micah, it tells hundreds of years before he was born, tells where he's going to be born. The city he is going to be born. Tell him that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child 700 years before he came in his incarnation. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 7, 14, that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And that's exactly what Gabriel told Mary. It came to pass, just exactly like God said it. But we see here... It also talks about the first fruits, and we talked about that last week, about Christ being the first fruits of the resurrection from the dead. And he went down and led captivity captive, according to Ephesians 4, and took them up as the, those sheaves. Remember, it's talking about the, the wave offering, the uh, first fruits from the Leviticus chapter 23, if you went home and read that. But it also talks about here that we're waiting for the redemption of the body. And see, when we got saved, we got an earnest, the Bible. You know, like when you get, get a loan for a home, you got to put down some earnest money. That tells them you're serious about it and you're going to produce the rest of it. So if we look over in the book of Acts, in chapter number 21, I'm just going to go through a, a couple verses here to show what this is speaking of. And here we're talking about the redemption of our bodies. And I have said it from this pulpit many times in this study in Romans that the flesh is not saved, right? right? It's cursed. It's going back to the dust of the earth. So what's he talking about? The redemption of our bodies. It has to be redeemed as well, right? 
because the Bible tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Like I said, you're not just going to, when the Lord comes, we're not going to go up just like we are and, and go right on, march right on into the gates of heaven and go on, go on home. It's not going to take place that way. But in Acts chapter 20, and here is a familiar reading of Scripture where Paul was about to leave Ephesus and all these people are gathered around him before he departs. But Paul says in verse number 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now this verse has some wonderful things in it. It's Paul's giving them a charge that first off, people that are over the church, the Holy Ghost gave them that authority. You don't give yourself that authority. Dad didn't call himself to be the pastor. The Lord does that. The Holy Ghost does that. And it also says the church of God, which is the body of Christ, right? The all born again, blood washed believers are in the body of Christ. The Bible teaches us we're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. But it tells us here it used the word God instead of Jesus because Jesus is God. <laughs> and it says God, it said the church of God, comma, which he, and that he is referring to God, hath purchased with his own blood. We are bought with a price, the Bible tells us. So the Lord owns us. Thank God. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Now, just taking a tidbit out of this verse, because we know that 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians is a rebuke to the Corinthian church because of their carnality and their worldliness. And here Paul is telling them, talking about fornication, and, and doing things in the body of the flesh. Notice what verse 19 says. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. And what does that say? Ye are not your own. I see this morning, folks, there's something that's important. And this whole study that we've been going through, a lot of these last chapters is talking about the Christian walk in this world being victorious, reckoning ourselves the way God does, knowing that we, we ain't got to worry about being lost once we get saved. But there, there are things in the Bible that teach us that we're going to pay if we sin. We're going to pay. Are we going to pay in heaven? You ain't going to pay up in heaven. That, the, the things of this life aren't be translated up there. When you suffer in the, for, for sin after you're saved, it happens in this life. This life. You can tell, I mean, we all know we've all suffered. We've all sinned. The Bible tells us for there is uh, none good. There's none righteous, none that seeketh after God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because we're in this flesh. Even as a Christian, we sin. And there are people that will teach in denominations or whatever it may be that if you sin, you lose your salvation. But that that's... That's crazy. It's, it's totally contrary to the Bible. Because if we were perfected when we got saved, as far as our flesh is concerned, what in the world is Christ doing at the right hand of the Father? Why is He making intercession for people who are perfect? You see, that doesn't make any sense. It's contradictory. If you, if you ain't going to sin... Then, what, then why is the Lord up there in a high priestly office doing that? Because what does a priest do? If you go back to the Old Testament, he makes a sacrifice first for himself, which Christ don't have to do that because he's God, but first for himself and then for the people. Once a year they made the atonement, but daily, daily sacrifices were made. And people, when they sinned for themselves, Dale, they would bring sacrifices for their own sin to the priest because that's the way God had it set up. They couldn't do it themselves. They had to bring it to the priest. So that priest typified their mediator between God 
and them. That's what Jesus said. There is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So his high priestly office now, currently, right now, make an intercession for us that are saved. So you can't lose it. So that's why I'm saying this is about victorious Christian life. And what this verse tells us here in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 is something that, have you ever heard, how many of you heard this verse before? Probably everybody in here has heard this verse, right? You're not your own. Have you heard that before? We all have, ain't we? But see, there's a thing about hearing the Word of God and applying it and doing it. There's two different things. A lot of folks that are Christians don't really take time to consider what this is telling us. Christianity, being saved, being born again, it's not a hobby. It's not a compartment of your life that you pull out and apply on Sunday and Wednesday. It's life itself. It's life itself. It's every moment of every hour of every day of your life. That's what being saved is. Because your life has been given to you. You didn't have a life before God. None of us did. People that are lost, they ain't got life. They're, they're in darkness. They're, they're dead spiritually. And when you get saved, you're quickened. And uh, Acts 20:28 20, told us that Christ bought us. God bought us with His own blood so therefore, we're not our own. It's not like, okay, Sunday and Wednesday, I'm a Christian. The rest of my life, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm living for myself. I'm going to try to get the best job I can get. I'm going to do this. There's nothing wrong with those things. But see, people focus on that stuff. See, as a Christian, everything in this world should be secondary. Christ and His service and the work of the church should be primary. That should be our focus. See, when I wake up in the day, I don't, I don't worry about if Coal Links is going to fold or if it's going to go under. I, I don't care. I don't care. That's not in my hands. I can't do nothing. Then people up there that's running that joint could be running it straight into the ground, and tomorrow I'll wake up and the whole place went bankrupt and closed down. It wouldn't have nothing to do with me because I, I'm just working there. But see, I, I don't worry about them things because I know who gave me that job. I know who's sitting on the throne. I know who can give me another job. And I believe this book when it says I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. I ain't going to have to worry about my meals. So all of my focus I can put an energy towards serving God and just trying to walk upright, try to have cleanse myself daily in this book, try to serve God as best I can. And see, if, if your focus is not that Christ owns you, then you're walking in the flesh. That's pretty simple, ain't it? If, if you're not realizing that the Lord God Almighty owns you, He has a right to instruct you in this book to tell you what to do. First off, because He's God. And we're His creatures. So even people that ain't saved ain't got a right to rebel against God. It ain't right. And, it, and the Bible proves that because if they die in their sin, they'll end up in hell. Because you're, you're a rebel. We were all rebels against God. The Bible said we're enemies of the cross. But Christ loved us even though we were enemies. Praise God. So we're not our own. Now let's look at Ephesians 1. The book is just a couple books over. Ephesians chapter number 1. Verses 12 through 14. Book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12. It says that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ in whom, which is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So we're sealed by the Holy Ghost. Nothing can be done about that. You'd have to be more powerful than God to remove that seal from the believer. 
And that seal, the Bible tells us right there, what that is, is an earnest of our inheritance. It's, it's, tell, it's a down payment on what, we're, what we got. And in Romans chapter 8, up in the previous verses, it tells us that we're heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. See, them things are coming. But we've, got, we've been sealed, and it's based on the veracity of God Himself that nothing can be done about it. The devil can't do nothing about it. The world can't do nothing about it. And praise God, I can't do nothing about it. Because I, th- I thank God that I can't mess it up. Because I would. If it was able, we all would. We'd lose it. We'd lose it. We'd, leave it. We'd do like we do our Bibles. And be like, oh man, I, I, I didn't have a chance to read for the last 22 days. I just didn't have time. I didn't have time to do it. We'd leave it at somewhere. You know what I'm saying? We would lose it because we can't do it. We can't do it. And thank God that it's based on Him who cannot fail. God can't fail. He can't lie. And He's got all power. So we don't have to worry about it. So the redemption of our body is based on His blood purchasing us and and birthing us into the family of God. Then He gives us His Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us and direct us in this life. And it's also called the Comforter. And He also seals us with that same Spirit, and that Spirit is the inherit and is the earnest of that inheritance that we got coming because of what Jesus did on Calvary. Praise God. So we're a purchased possession. Now let's look at 1 John chapter number 3. And all these verses tie together about the redemption of the body. 1 John chapter number 3. And this is a wonderful scripture right here. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew not Him. That right there, that verse kind of throws a a monkey wrench in people that teach, hey, we're all the sons of God. The Bible said the world don't know Him. The world don't know Him. And they don't even know us because we're born of Him. Beloved, I love this word. Now. Right now. Not future. Not there. See, we got the earnest of the inheritance. There's a will, like say, if your your parents leave a will for you, you've got an inheritance coming. I don't know if anybody in here does, but I'm just saying, if you do, it's written down and it's lawful. And when that person expires, it's yours. That, that legal document tells you that it already belongs to you. You just can't claim it right now. But it's yours, right? Just like what we're looking at here. We have the earnest of this inheritance. And it says, now we are the sons of God. And it says, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. That's the redemption of the body. When He comes, we ain't going to stand before God like this. We ain't going to go into the the, the presence of the Almighty like this. Because we would be consumed. The Bible says, no man can see me and live. That's what He told Moses, right? When Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. When he was all fed up with them backbiters and and God-haters and murmurs and complainers of Israel... And they'd be ready to stone him and throw him in the ditch somewhere. He's like, Lord, just show me your glory. And he said, I, you can't see it. But there is a place where I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. And I'll put my hand over you. And when I pass by, you can see my hinder parts. Because no man will see me and live. That's what he told Moses. So it tells us here that when we see the Lord, does that not make you happy that you're going to see him? I read the Gospels and I just, I just try to imagine what he looked like. The Bible specifically don't tell us because it ain't for us to know. But I imagine to hear, you know, the men said, never a man spake like this man. I mean, there's some people in this world I like to hear talk. You know, like people like Alexander Scurvy who reads the Bible. I like to hear their voice because it's, it's just something about it I like. But there's never going to be a voice like the Lord Jesus Christ. And... I've always wondered them things, but there is coming a day when we all will get to see them. Everybody. Praise the Lord. I may never see the president. Don't really care if I see the president. 
movie stars and all these people. I mean, people lose their mind when they see some of these celebrities. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. It's it's idolatry. But there's nobody on this earth that I desire to see like my Savior. And then one day we're going to see him. It says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purify himself, even as he is pure. So we see at the redemption of the body, Christ bought us with his own blood. Everybody that's ever born again and saved is birthed into the family of God and the church of God. They're bought by blood. Somebody tells you you can get saved without the blood of Christ, that's a lie. Without the blood, the shedding of blood, there's no remission. That's Hebrews 9.22, uh, uh, I believe it is. I know 9.27 is, you know, for, for every man that's appointed unto man wants to die. But in that same chapter, it says, without the shedding of the blood, there's no remission. Period. You can't get saved without blood. And he's purchased us with his blood. He's, he's sealed us with his spirit. And that same spirit we read last week is going to raise us up when he comes. It's going to, it's going to pull us away from this earth. And see, and back in Romans chapter 8, Paul's telling us all of these things because he wants us to, to have a, a very specific view of our lives in this world. And it's to serve God. That's what it is. He bought us. He, he called us to service. Did he not, Cooper? Yes. He did. He called us to do His work. And then there are people, it's sad to say, some of the, some of the pastors in, this, in, the, in the world don't want the people out there to do the work because they want all the glory. They want to say, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You guys just hang on. I'm, I'll, I got this. That ain't what the Bible teaches about the church. We're a body. We all have a function. We all have a job to do. Whenever, every day of your life, that you live when you're serving God, you're doing your work. Being a light, studying, reading, and praying, you don't know who God's going to send to you that day. You don't know what you're going to face that day. But all of it is for His honor and glory, and He's called us to that work. But it says here, back in Romans 8, in verse 24, for we are saved by hope. Hope. The world ain't got much. I mean, I say right now, outside of God, America's gone. I've said that. There's no hope. There ain't no hope. I mean, me and uh, Dad and Brother Gary was just talking back there about how you can't even get people to work. You can't get them to work. If, you, if, if going to work and getting a paycheck is not motivation enough for you to go to work, what in the world else is going to help people to, to get motivated? What motivates me is every two weeks I look at my account and there's money in there. That's what motivates me because then I can take that money and pay the bills that I got. And feed myself, feed my wife, my kids, and pay for all the stuff that we have. I mean, take care of the things God's blessed me with. Everything that I got, He gave it to me. My job, He gave it to me. My health, I can't do my job without health and strength. I got to get that from God. I mean, Brother Terry, he's retired, right? Sister Riley, you retired as well. God gave him the strength to do that work all them years. And he blessed them with it. And they were able to retire. Brother Gary, same thing. I mean, it's just, that's God done that. But see, man can look at it and say, well, I worked for 40 years for everything I got. How would you work if you didn't breathe? How would you work if you wasn't laid up on your back somewhere with a sickness some people, they don't ever get to work. They can't because they're, they're down on their self their, their, whole, their whole life. They've been, they have an illness that they can't get over. Some people, hey, thank God, I'm glad I can work. Amen. Praise God. And see, the Bible tells us if a man don't work, he don't eat. He don't eat. Now, there's some people that can't. That's not, we're not talking about people that are physically not able to do it. But God's blessed us with all these things. And then see... Think about if your life, you read the book of Ecclesiastes and you'll figure out all that life is in the natural realm. It's vanity. It's nothing. It's meaningless. Think about it if you did, if you wasn't saved and you didn't know, we didn't know nothing about God. We wake up and say, well, all we see is people dying. How old do you get? You're surrounded by death. People you love dying off, family members dying off, and you know it's coming for you. 
And hey, all the things you've done in your life is meaningless when you get to that point. Because you're like, boy, I wish I could have another day. I wish I could have a couple more years to live so I could do some things I never got to do. It's vanity. It doesn't do you no good. You gain all this stuff. Solomon even talked about getting all that wealth and all them things. He says, who knows if I'm going to leave it to one of my kids that's a fool and he'll squander everything that I worked all this time to get. And he said, that's vanity. He said, I'd rather not to have it. And then just squander it all over the place. But that's, that's, there's no hope in this life. That's what I'm saying. There is no hope in this life because you know what you got to hope for? Death. Yeah. That's it. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Our children's going to die. Our parents are going to die. All of us are going to die and go back to the dust of the earth. But God gave us an opportunity to have life to get saved, to get born again, to be reconciled unto Him, to have life eternal because this is not it. This is not it. It's on the other side. But we got hope. As a Christian, we got hope. There is a better day coming, like I said last week. We got something to look forward to. But notice about this. The word hope is a funny thing because verse 24 explains it. It says, but hope that is seen is not hope. When I get paid and I look at my account, I don't say, boy, I hope I get paid. No, I got paid. I got it right there. You don't hope for something you have. You're hoping for something that you don't have. And he says, for what man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Like I said, there's suffering in this life. It makes it hard to deal with things sometimes. Now, like I know there's people in here, like I say many times, we've got people that deal with chronic pain. I don't know how that feels. Someday I might. If the Lord lets me live, He may strike me with that, and I have to deal with it. But there's a day coming where that ain't going to happen no more. It ain't going to happen no more. You ain't got to worry about that. God's going to remove it. And think how good God is to only allow you to suffer for that long, and then the eternity before you is going to be pure, holy bliss with the Lord Jesus Christ in a redeemed body. Yes. Glory to God Almighty. Praise the Lord. I did some work yesterday. Been mowing my neighbor's yard and cleaning up all of his landscaping. And I tell you, see, I sit at the desk. Uh, you can tell that I'm not a, a hard-working fellow because of the body that I got. But when I got out there, I was carrying Dad's backpack blower around, raking. I mean, just running back and forth with a wheelbarrow. I woke up this morning and felt like somebody beat me with a rod. <laughs> see, I don't want to feel like that again. But it makes me thankful that I'm able to do it, that I have the ability to do them things because I'm reminded of people that can't do it. And I'm grateful that I can and take advantage while I got it. But see, I'm hoping for a day when I don't have to do that stuff no more. I don't have to deal with pain. I don't, you'll, I'll never get a call saying, hey, so-and-so has been diagnosed with cancer. I'll never have to hear the doctor say, you know, there's nothing we can do for you because God's going to do it all. He's going to do it all. He's going to redeem this body. So therefore, whatever I endure, I've got hope. Whatever comes in my life, I can look to that hope and not worry because God has promised me and you that He will bring it to pass. It's going to, he said we shall see Him as He is. We know that we shall be like Him because we're going to see Him like He is. So we have to be changed. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us about that change if you want to go home and read that. But in this life, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be troubles. There's going to be trials. But the Lord Jesus is with us. Let's look at John 15, 18. The book of John. Gospel of John chapter 15 and verse number 18. As a Christian, you ain't going to be popular with this world. You ain't going to be. Dale, let me ask you something, brother. Before you got sick, before you start, got things right with God, everybody liked you, didn't they? You got along with everybody pretty well. Did you notice a change amongst those same people that are surrounding you after you started serving the Lord? Some attitudes toward you changed, did it not? 
sometimes sometimes people that you would cut up with and, and have fun with, they don't really want to spend that much time around you anymore. Especially when you start talking about the Lord or inviting them to church, trying to get them to have what you have. We know that it's a fact. First off, we experience it, but Jesus said it. Right here in John 15, 18, he says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And that's why they hate us, because they hate God. And see, a lot of people, they're not against you and I, but they're against God. And anybody who stands for Him and wants to represent Him, they hate them too. So look at, look at 1 John chapter number 3. So now this is the same man under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that wrote John the Beloved. 1 John chapter number 3, which we've already went to, but we're going to look a little further on in this chapter. 1 John 3.13 Notice what this says. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. They hate us. They hate God. The world hates God. So therefore, we're going to experience a blowback from the world because of our testimony for Christ. If you, you know, there are, there are people that are the, the quote-unquote silent Christians who come to church, they serve God, but when they're around people, they never mention God because they don't want to stir up trouble. They don't want to deal with the confrontation that comes with it sometimes. But I'll agree with a oh man, Brother Oliver Green said, some people say they're one of the silent Christians. He said, well, they went out about 2,000 years ago. You know, and the Lord said, they said, hey, these sayings are too hard for us. And they left. All of them left the Lord. He said that from that point, many of them followed him no more. And he looked at the disciples and said, will you go away also? But Peter said, hey, Lord, where can we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. See, we know that there's no other source of help. We know there's nowhere else to go. We know that God's it. That's all we need. And if the world, the whole world turns away from us, Cooper, we still got God, which means we got it all. So there's the hope we have. We don't have to worry about when, when sickness comes, when trials and tribulations come, when persecution comes, we still got God. We st nothing will take away that hope. Nothing will take away that hope. It's always going to be ours because we've been sealed by that Spirit. It belongs to us. Now we are the sons of God is what the Bible says. Look at 2 Timothy 3.12. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. In verse 12, right after 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 2nd Thessalonians, Timothy 3, 12. He says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, it's going to happen, shall suffer persecution. And I tell you, I see it on the horizon for our, for our, for our country. It's already taken place. These people that are, that are in government now, they hate God. People that are in the school system, they hate God. People in the colleges, they hate God. You have people standing up saying we need to get rid of the police. And, and, and they're actually being taken seriously. Who then people going to call when they get rid of the cops? Anybody going to be there? I want the cops. I want them around. I want the fire department. I want the EMTs. I want somebody when I call, I want some help. And some people say, well, I got my guns. I'm good. I'm telling you, folks, we can't really, truly, honestly protect ourselves. We can't. God ordained government to put down bad people to protect the innocent. It's in the Bible. That's why he done them things. That's why he went when in, in the time of Israel and the children of Israel when he set up the tabernacle and gave them all them laws, when people killed somebody, 
They killed them. Because you have to get sin out of the camp. They took them outside of that camp and stoned them. Because you cannot allow it to, to stay in the camp or it will destroy everything. How many of these people we put in prison get out and do the same thing again? There, there's no such thing as, oh, I'm reformed. Well, if you say you've been saved and born again, I'll believe it. God can make them a new creature. Anybody. I care what they've done. But to go man's way, that ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. We can't fix it. But it's, it's insane to think that we're going to try to do something in this world that's not going to result in death. But on this subject right here, persecution has come. It's come many times through history to, to God's people. Read about the apostles. Their own, their own people, the, the Jews, their own brethren, pulled them inside, put them under arrest, threw them in prison, beat the daylights out of them, stripped them and sent them back out, told them not to preach in the name of Jesus. They didn't stop them. They had this hope right here. They got it. We got this hope. We can't do away with it. And Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 tells us that it's, you're put under a curse if you put on the cross. It also says in the Old Testament, Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. So when, when, the Lord, when the Lord tells us, if any man follow me, let him take up his cross. Right? Deny himself and follow me. There's some important steps right there. When you take up your cross, you can't follow God without denying self. You see that sequence of that? Some people, I'm afraid, some Christians are afraid, their cross is still laying there. They ain't never picked it up. They definitely ain't denied their self, and they ain't following God. Here it said all those that who are going to serve for persecution? People that's carnal? People that's living loose and ain't trying to serve God, now you ain't going to suffer. You may suffer physically because God's going to strike you. But are you suffering for the cause of Christ is what I'm saying. If we do what God says and we pick up that cross and we follow Him, we are going to suffer. It says it right here. Shall suffer persecution. We're go it's going to happen. But what do we got to worry about? God's still God, ain't He? We still got that hope. It doesn't take away the seal of the Holy Ghost of God. It doesn't take away the fact that we're joint heirs of God and or heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. They don't take none of that stuff away. God's made it to where we can face anything. And that's why Paul is trying to get us to understand. Always going to go back to it. Reckon yourself like God does. You're saved. You're born again. You're purchased. You're in the body of Christ. Your soul cannot be touched by the devil or the world. They don't care if they even kill your body. That's all they're going to do. And that's going back to the dust of the earth anyways. So what does it matter if somebody kills you or, you or you die from old age or some sickness or illness? It doesn't matter. It's not going to change who we are and what we got in Christ. But back in Romans 8, let's, let's, let's look at this last verse here and I'll close it out. Romans chapter number 8. And let's look down here. Read this again. For we are saved by hope, verse 24, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. It's easy to wait on God if you take him at his word. Some people want to get ahead of God. But see, you got to realize God is not in time. He's not in time. He is outside of time. It was an awesome thing. Now, you may think this is foolish, but for me, it was a marvelous revelation when I realized that time is... God created it. He's not bound by that. He created time in the beginning. For something to have a beginning or a middle or any kind of point in there, it's, it's in time. 
So in the beginning is the beginning. That's the starting of time. So God is not worried about time. He's not concerned about time. There's dates that he has got set. But as far as we go, I don't worry about when he does something for me because I know he's going to do everything for me. And I know when he does it, it's the right time, period. That's a, that's, that's a good thing to settle in your Christian life. Say, well, I wish if I would have had this on this day, if I'd have got this, if the Lord would have blessed me with this, I wouldn't have had all these problems. No, God knew what he was doing. He knows what he's doing. So just trust him and live the Christian life. That's how simple that, that it is. Wake up every morning. Thank God for being saved. Thank Him for your health and strength. Give Him honor. Give Him glory. Give Him praise. Say, hey, whatever you got for me today, Lord, I want it. Good or bad. Because I know it's for my own benefit. And I know you're going to be with me. And I got hope that one day, there ain't gonna be, I'm going to wake up. There ain't going to be no more troubles. There ain't going to be no more trials. There ain't going to be no more sickness. All them things are going to be wiped away and never to be seen again. That's hope. That's what we got. Nobody in this world's got that. Ain't nobody out there got that. You say, hey, how, how's things going for you? You ask them. They'll, they'll start telling you everything that's wrong with them. I mean, you wish you had never even asked the question. But then it breaks your heart for them people because they don't have what we got. They don't have that hope. They say, I, I, there's no end in sight. I can't do this. I can. And they get to the point where some people take their own life because they're so hopeless. And that, that's just heartbreaking. Because God wants us to have life and have it more abundantly. He died for all mankind. And He wants them to have it. But we of all people are to act like we got some hope. But sometimes we don't, do we? We fall short. We get discouraged. We're weak. God's got to encourage us. This is a good way to get encouraged right here is to read this book. God will help you. You, you feast on this every day. And you, your soul is going to grow. Yeah, you got to deny that self. Your flesh don't want you to read this. But boy, God sure does. But I hope you got something out of it this morning.